Thanks to media. My name is Curtis. I'm blessed to be the pastor here at the Salem Methodist Church. Um, and today is actually a really special and important day for us because we are blessed with two great things. Number one, y'all don't have to listen to me preach today. Hallelujah. Oh, <laughs> but also we are blessed because uh, Miss Elizabeth from the Methodist Children's Home is here. She's going to be sharing God's message. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about her uh, right before our sermon time. But something that struck me, I shared this in first service, is the scripture that the Lord has put on our heart. And it's what's known as the love chapter in the Bible. It's, it, it's from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And personally, for years, I kind of overlooked the first part of the chapter, if you're familiar with it at all, where, where it basically says, look, if, if we have all the wisdom and wealth and power in the world, but we don't have love, we're nothing. We're like a clinging gong or a classroom symbol. And we, we, we so often skip over that part because of the next part where it says love is kind, love is gentle, it is peaceful. But something struck me a few years back about that. Y'all, I know some people that I love dearly that sound like a clinging gong or classroom symbol. I know some people that have all the wisdom in the world. I mean, they're brilliant people. But they don't have love. And when they talk, it just, they go on and on and on and on. And they're just making noise. I know people that, that sit there and talk about the injustices and the wrongs of this world, which is not, not a bad thing to do. But if they don't have love in their heart, all they do is just complain about it over and over and over again. It's like, it's like we are so okay with saying this is wrong, but we're not willing to be a part of the love of healing and fixing in the mix of all that. And so my challenge for myself, my challenge for us today, is because we do have the love of Christ in us, we have been made new, we are changed, we are different than the world. Let us catch ourselves when it's tempting to just make noise. And let's make sure there's some love involved in that in one way or another. We have a couple of announcements for us this morning. Um, first of all, uh, we are going to be starting our Holy Crafters group again. If you're not familiar with that, we have a, a, a couple in this church that are just amazing at not only crafting, but teaching how to craft. And this time what they're going to be doing is they're going to be teaching us how to make these pumpkins here. Okay? Three different sizes, large, medium, small. You're going to get all three sizes. And it is a suggested donation of $10. That's it. That covers all the cost. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put this sign-up sheet at the back of the Narthex. After service today, there's only room for 12 people to sign up. It's going to be on October 23rd, 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and if you're interested in it or you want some more information, come see me. There's also going to be some variations. They're going to have different colors to go on the inside and stuff like that. Also, I want to share with y'all that uh, next week is a really cool, great Sunday as well. I'm really looking forward to this because next week is what's called Laity Sunday for us. Everyone who is not a pastor here, which I'm thinking is the great majority of us, right? Okay, You are the laity of the church. That's just a fun, fancy word we use because we like to sound smart. Uh, once a year, I love this. My job is to get out of the way. Because the power and the work of God's kingdom can be done by other people besides me. And so next Sunday, Jerry Smith, our lay leader, is going to be sharing God's message with us. And so I'm really looking forward to that. Next Sunday is also our Operation Christmas Child Launch Sunday. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you don't know much about Operation Christmas Child, you're going to learn a ton at that time. We're going to take our uh, announcement time. We're going to share a short video. And we're going to share how you can be a part of this awesome ministry that has been at the heart of Salem since long before I was here. All right, I think that's it. Is there anything else for the good of the family? Will you all join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father God, especially on this Sunday, we come into your house of worship. We sit at your feet, open-hearted, ready to worship you. And we pray, Lord, that as we go through words that we do not say every week and words that we do, 
That you would help us to be sharp and mindful of what we say. May we not just go on and on like a clanging symbol. Holy Spirit, let us hear the words of our mouths. Let us mean them. And in so doing, Lord, will you please speak into us that which you would have us hear. And we'll be very careful to give you and only you all the glory, honor, and praise now and forever. Then the people asked for a king, 
And he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled forty years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you are looking for, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Fellow children of Abraham, and you, God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that the message of salvation has been sent. Y'all, the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's continue worshiping together through our tithes and our offerings. I want to remind you, as I try too often, that if you are a guest here, you do not need to feel pressured or pushed to give. We are just honored to have you in our midst. Let's continue worshiping. is doing and will do. I invite you to stand as you're able and join us in singing the doxology.
that in an act of love and obedience, we take a moment right now and we pray that most beautiful prayer that your son taught us, the Lord's Prayer, which is also on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You all may have a seat. I want to invite all the young people, anybody who is 11 or under, to start making their way down with the light in. And I need you all to help me help them feel welcome by singing, Jesus Loves Me. Specific. Many of us, well, not many of us, a number of us wear these on our face, and Alara just started wearing them. Glasses case. Glasses case. Good job. Girl, I knew you was going to figure it out. Hey, that's okay. I gave a good clue. That just means you chose something really good. So why don't you stand up and both show everybody your glasses case and your pretty new glasses? Nice. I love it. Oh, yeah, we got another pair in there. I'm going to wear it. Okay. So, Alara is wearing her rainbow glasses. She loves rainbows. That's like her... If you ask her what her favorite color is, it's rainbow. Okay? <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's all right. So... Oops, baby. All right, so we're going to pay attention over here right now, okay? All right. Thanks, buddy. So, let me tell you girls something. Y'all know... I know this is a surprise to you. But Daddy wears glasses. I know. wear them every day. Did, did yeah. you know that I wear glasses? Yeah. But did you know that if I take my glasses off, I can actually see pretty well? Uh. Mm -hmm. I can see the numbers on that clock, but if I put these on, I can see them better. So for a long time, I did not wear glasses. It was only a few years ago that I started wearing them. But my doctor told me I was supposed to wear them all the way back till when I was in middle school. Did you know that? And the reason why my vision is so well is because apparently my brain is compensated really, really well for the vision. The problem is that I would get extremely tired and my eyes would hurt and it actually led into my dyslexia quite a bit and I had no idea because my mind was using so much power 
to just keep my vision clear. You see, sometimes we go out in the world and we see stuff that we don't understand. Have, well, watch this. Have any of you adults ever had a situation where you go, you know what, I'm just not quite sure what God wants me to do in this situation. You ever been there before? I mean, the, the Bible gives us the keys to all things, but it doesn't address every situation. Let's set up, please. And so what, what ends up happening is we need to make the best choices that we can. At the end of the day, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we have our vision correct. You see, a lot of people say, I'm a Christian and I follow God. But they don't have a changed heart. Or they don't follow what the Bible says. Or when they come to church, they just come to church so that other people can see them and they can be popular. But we need to come to church. We need to read the Bible, not putting all of our energy into other things, but into being changed by the Holy Spirit. You see, because I can look really good like this, and I can pretend all day long that I'm okay, right? But at the end of the day, things are not as good as they could be. Not until I get my vision clear. And so the best way to do that is just to get to know God better. All right? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's pray. Not right now, okay? All right, let's pray. Dear God, Dear God. we thank you for your love. That changes us. I want your help. In being changed. The way you want. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright. So, baby, you get the box today. And Miss Stephanie, how's CJ feeling? I know he wasn't feeling too good. I'm sorry? Give him our love, would you? All right, y'all go ahead to Children's Church.
as the player begins to make their way down, um, Amber's over here. Uh, I, I want to I share something with you. I, I think I've shared a little bit about this in the past. Uh, and for our online congregation, I uh, just want to let you know that since our young people have left the congregation, I'm going to be sharing some a little bit more PG stuff for just a brief moment if you'll uh, uh, indulge me to. Many of you know that before I was a preacher, I, I, was, a, I was a youth pastor. And we worked with a lot of at-risk, abandoned youth and, and abused teens. And on more than more occasions than I care to count, I would have a kid come to youth group and they look exhausted. I'm like, man, what's wrong? They go, oh, mom was selling herself again last night and she would let me in. I just live on the porch. Or man, you look hungry today. You've been getting a lot of food. We always gave them dinner. Yeah, there hasn't been food in the house. My, uh, Dad's been throwing drug parties <clears throat> every other night. Yo, this is Central Florida. This isn't Orlando or Miami. This is rural area, just like Havana. We, we would have kids that, that would come in, and uh, I'll just say that we had, we had a, a mantra that we would use that would teach all of my volunteers all the time. We, we would tell them that L-O-V-E is the dirtiest four-letter word that many of these kids have ever heard, and they've heard a lot more words than some of us have ever said. All right? And the reason why is because of how people have used that word to hurt them. And, and so our mantra was that we love them until they believe this love isn't going to do something mean to them. We love them until they believe this love isn't, going, isn't there to take advantage of them, manipulate them, try to use one a kid or get one parent against another or worse. And then we need to love them until they believe this love wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't going to bail on them. And the whole time we would tell them where that love comes from. On several occasions, I would have, we'd have like lock-ins sometimes, guys with me at, at our apartment, Amy and I had, and then, you know, girls at the church. And, and on more than one occasion, these kids would go, man, I, I wish, I hope I grow up to be as, as rich as you. We, we lived in a duplex that smelled horrible, and it looked like one trailer on top of another, and the carpeting was at least twice as old as I was. And then I started pointing that out to them, and, and they said, no, just how much you and Amy love each other. We are not a model couple by any stretch, but it was the dream life for them. We are blessed today to have um, Elizabeth Gad here. Elizabeth is the, I'm going to get this right here, Chief Development Officer for the Madison Youth Ranch for the Methodist Children's Home. Um, Elizabeth goes all over the state of Florida. She shares about this awesome ministry, about these broken, hurting kids that not only we can do something to impact, but that Salem is. This has been a, a love of this congregation since long before my time. And so I'm really excited today to, to introduce Elizabeth. I'm going to invite you to come forward and share with us what the Lord's friend heart. You know, the traditional type of orphans that we think of. What I call our 
modern day orphans are the ones who, in, in reality, they have parents who are still alive. But yet, because they can't overcome the demons in their lives, their addictions, all of the things that they have going on, they can't be the parents these children need. And consequently, the state comes to a point where they say, if you can't get it together, then we're going to terminate your rights. And that's what they do. So you'll hear stories about those children in our care today as I share the message. I want to share something very briefly before I get started. Uh, we are going through a name change at the Children's Home, so be, stay tuned. We have a name selected. I'm not able to share it with you yet. I can tell you it's two words. I call it our five-year journey to here. We, um, we have the name. We're working on the logo right now. That should be completed by the end of the year. I expect us to be able to roll it out in the spring, so I would say by Easter, certainly. It's um, been a long time coming, as I referenced, the five-year journey to here. Um, and we've purposely been working on it the last year, but it's taken a little bit longer, and we had to change rebrand companies in the midst of it all, and we'll get into that. But yeah, so it's been a journey. Um, so the message today is on faith, hope, and love. And you know, Paul talks about Faith, hope, and love is the three foundational components for Christian living. The scripture reference for today is 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm going to go 1 through 13, and I'm going to cut out part of it for time's sake. If I speak in tongues, it's going to start. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains that have not love, I am nothing. If I give all away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be buried but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Which says, now the three of these remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So now that we've read the scriptures for today, I want you to think about a time when you've struggled with your faith. You know, it might be some difficult time that you're going through, or it might be questioning the mere essence of God. Or perhaps you have struggled with hope. When you're in the, that pit of light and you feel like you can't see the light at the other end of the tunnel. Or perhaps times when you have felt alone. There might be people around you that you feel for all intent and purposes like you're in an island of your own. There's no one around to give you the love and the comfort and the support that you need. Friends, that is exactly how our children feel when they come into our care. In essence, they've been stripped to their core of everything that they've ever known. They don't have faith because they don't know God. They've lost hope because their world has been shattered. They don't have anything that they had in the reality is uncertain. And finally, they don't see anyone around who they can connect with for love and support. Well, I'm here to tell you that that might be their initial reality when they first come to us. But that quickly changes. And it does so in part thanks to your generosity. Because you help provide a way for our children. You help them to come, become triumphant, as I like to say. You help to transform their lives through your support. We encourage our children to have hope. We want them to rest in the assurance 
that they can overcome their past and focus on a brighter future. We also want them to realize that God's love surpasses all understanding, as well as the true essence of love, which has been distorted for so many of our children, just like Curtis just alluded to. You see, faith, hope, and love are often called the three foundations of Christian living. In fact, Paul wrote about it in 1 Corinthians in a letter to the church at Corinth, because they were going through some things. Like the children's home, our residential, our spiritual life, and our therapeutic teams set out to teach our children these foundational components in order to set them on a path to a brighter future. So let's focus on faith for a moment. At the core of everything we do at the children's home is rooted in our faith in Christ. And while I mentioned that our name is changing, our identity is not changing. We are still rooted in our Christian foundation, our Christian heritage, which we're very proud of. If you've been to visit our campuses, you know that on each campus we prominently have a chapel, which regularly gets used by our children. And while our children aren't required to go to chapel, sometimes we have some holdouts, but it doesn't last long. You see, because our staff makes it inviting for them. And those who are, or have decided not to participate realize that they're missing out on fun times and engaging opportunities. In fact, many of our children choose to make a profession of faith while they're in our care. I'll share with you about Ren. Ren and her sister have been in the system the majority of their lives. They're middle teenage girls now. They have been separated for 13 years in the system. While Ren's sister was in our care, and if you all know anything about the children's home, you know that it's very important for us to keep siblings together. Well, so when we found out that Ren was at another organization being served, we worked with the powers to be to arrange for Ren to come and live at the children's home. One of the first things that happens when a child comes into our care, besides their, their care plan, is our pastor, Pastor Madeline, sits down with them and does what's called a spiritual life inventory. Have they ever heard of God? What is their impression of God? Have their parents ever taken them to church? What's their impression of church? Do they have a relationship? Well, in doing so, that, that doing so with Wren, we found out that Wren was an atheist. Not only was she an atheist, she was very proud to tell us that she was an atheist. She was good there. But I'm here to tell you today that through her time here at the children's home, she got involved in our spiritual life program. In fact, she belongs to our praise band team, team today. And she came as she came to know Christ. She wrote a story about her journey, and she wrote a song. Because you see, song is actually therapeutic for our children. So we encourage our children to write songs. Sometimes the language is a little colorful, we have to work through that. But anyway, we work past those things. So Pastor Madeline gave her the pulpit one day. Now, Pastor Madeline's been with us like seven years. She never turned over the pulpit to a child but she did for Ren. And Ren shared in song and testimony about her journey. Can you imagine for a moment the impact of that on her peers? It wasn't like you or I standing up giving a message. I can only imagine that that message took on a whole different tone and tenor that day, wouldn't you? Friends, last year alone, we had ten children make a profession of faith, six of whom were baptized. Praise be to God. The Apostle Paul talks about faith. In particular, he talks about Abraham and how Abraham exhibited the greatest example of faith in Romans chapter 4. And in this case, Abraham knew that God was who he was and that he would do what he said he would do, right? Similarly, our spiritual life program in the daily indwelling of our house parent staff, our 
therapeutic staff, and everyone else involved at the Children's Home teaches our children each and every day to have faith. They teach them that God sent his son to buy our freedom through faith in him. You see, God adopts us as our children, as his children, through faith is reflected by Paul in Galatians 4, 4 through 7. Our children at the home, you see, they are no longer orphans. They're no longer rejected by those who are supposed to be caring for them, as we've talked about this morning. Why? Because they have a new identity. Their identity is rooted in Christ. And fortunately, many of our orphan children, they find a new earthly family. I'll tell you about Dulce. Dulce was a child at the ranch. Dulce and her sisters were have been in the system. And they were up for adoption. And this family decided to adopt them. But as they started going through the process, Dulce was acting out. She was a budding teenager. And I would say she was exhibiting the junk in her trunk, if you know what I mean. You know, it all comes spilling out at some point. So this family said, we don't want her. We want the two younger ones, but we don't want her. Can you only imagine how that made Dulce feel? The rejection in her heart. So when she came to the ranch, of course she was discouraged. She was hurt. She had been rejected. She said, I'm never going to find a family. No one's ever going to want me. But you know what our staff did at the ranch? They said, oh, no, baby girl. We're going to pray for you. At every staff meeting, you will be lifted up. And we're going to pray that God will bring you a family. And they did just that. So here's, here's the other side part of that story. Six or eight years ago, a couple got married. And at that time, they committed to adopt a child. And they tried a couple times along the way, and it just didn't work out. Well, earlier this year, they saw a picture of Dulce. And they decided that they wanted to meet her. Well, simultaneously, Dulce's going through convocation classes. Dulce comes to know Christ. Do you see all of this working in parallel together? So they meet Dulce. Dulce's so excited. She keeps coming to the staff. She's like, I think this is my family. I think these are my people. And the staff is just, you know, okay. It's like, just going to walk through this casually. Let's not get too excited too soon. Well, in the end, Dulce did go to live with her adoptive family at the end of July. Praise be to God for her. But think about that. Think about Dulce's journey for a moment. Dulce had no faith. She had lost hope. But through this process, all of that was renewed. God never fails, does he? God keeps his promises. I get excited when I start talking about my children now. These are the lives that you're changing each and every day. All right. Shifting gears. You know, in Hebrews 11, it tells us that it's impossible to please God without faith. Because we have to admit that he exists. And that he will reward those who seek him. This chapter is replete with examples of his servants who have stepped out in faith. Think about Abraham. He went into a foreign land, which would eventually become his inheritance. Or think about when he offered up his child as a sacrifice. Can you even imagine? But there's also times when it serves as a beacon of hope to those who have stepped out in faith and had to wait, don't say. They had to wait on God to 
answered their prayers. You see, hope is intrinsically tied to faith. You must have faith in order to have hope. Romans 5, 1 says, we are justified through faith in Christ. And then in verse 5, it says, hope does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who he has given to us. The two are tied together because faith is God's promise. And hope is God's tool that enables us to hold on to those promises. You see, Paul shared with the Romans about this and leaves it as a legacy in God's word. As a reminder today, God keeps his promises. It's through hope in Christ that we place our trust that he will provide. He always does. Romans 5 reminds us that our hope sometimes comes from our suffering and our brokenness. Think about our children. Hope, friends, is not just for the dark times. It's for all times. As we seek the brightness in hope, we are able to persevere and to grow stronger in character, which will also help us as we face those difficult times. They will come. Specifically, it's the knowledge and understanding that God has brought us through these difficulties. So we can have hope that he'll do it again. Think about Job and all that he endured, all of those tragedies, the pain and the despair in his life. And yet hope was the catalyst that carried him At the children's home, our children come to learn that God hears our cries and he gives us hope. Remember Dulce? Our children have all been through traumatic times, which have obviously brought them into our care. One young adult in our independent living program shared that he is appreciative that he has a safe place to call home, that he wasn't just kicked out on the street when he turned 18. He's thankful that we're helping him work towards self-sufficiency and independence. He has hope in a brighter future. And why is that so important that we have a place for him to call home after he turns 18? Because 30 to 40 percent of our young people across this country end up homeless. One teenager said, you just might find Jesus in the midst of things here. You see, that again reflects hope in Christ. In fact, it complements the young girl who shared with us that no one has had a perfect life. But as we trust in God and pray, you will always see miracles happening. Her hope for each and every child that's been in a bad situation like she has been in is to be at the children's home happy and joyful. She expressed thankfulness to God for placing her in the children's home. I believe that each and every child who's placed in our care is done so by divine intervention. It's not done by happenstance. This young girl was actually adopted by her grandparents. Her grandfather died of cancer about a year ago. She's a precious girl. She's now an adult. She's a great living testament of having faith and hope, and she's living that out today. And friends, she's only in this place because she has faith in Christ and a bright future. You know, it's times like this and seeking hope that we find new opportunities, renewal, creativity, or seeking growth for a brighter future instead of focusing Finally, love. God is love. God is compassion. Love is the greatest of all of the spiritual gifts. In fact, Galatians 5, 6 tells us that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Without love, we can do very little. However, when God
God's love takes over in us, he sets us on a new path for a brighter future and inspires us for growth and our ability to thrive in him. Friends, you demonstrate that through all that you do, through prayers, through love, through support, and of course your generosity in support of our children. The mission of the children's home is to empower children and families to experience the transforming love of Christ through evidence-based care and holistic services. For example, many of our children have never known the true essence of love in their lives. One family of children who came to us had been sexually abused by both parents. They only knew love through inappropriate touch, hence what you were sharing earlier. Our staff had to, in effect, rewire their brains. We utilized something called NMT therapy at the children's home. It's not invasive. We don't stick wires in there. We're able to map out those spots of trauma in their brains, and that helps us to provide therapy in a more targeted way. It's really quite incredible. One girl shared with our staff that they have taught her that everyone in the world needs love and affection. Others reflected that they experience love as demonstrated through the stability that we provide them. Remember, they come from chaotic backgrounds. This reminds me of 1 Corinthians 13, 7, where Paul talks about how God's love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Perseveres is a big word to you. In fact, this is the kind of love that Paul expected to see in the church, in the church at Corinth. So as we tie it all together, it first takes faith to believe that his grace is sufficient. And that requires that we entrust in him with the big and little things on a daily basis. In other words, if God has promised you something, then only believing in him to fulfill it will demonstrate faith in him. Our hope should be rooted in Christ in eternity. That is most effectively revealed in those trying times. Love should be the center of our lives. So examine your hearts, my friends. What are your motives? Go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Do you judge when you should encourage? Do you get impatient or become easily angered? Do you focus on the messiness of your current circumstances? One way to overcome that is to focus Remember Romans 5, 5, which says, God's poured out his love in and through us, through the Holy Spirit, which he, whom he has given to us. And as we look upward at his wonder, and we look outward to see the smiling faces, we get outside of ourselves. So faith, hope, and love are the three foundational stones of Christian life. And the Apostle Paul wrote that the greatest of these and because of you, we are able to help inspire, transform, and encourage the 300-plus children and families that we support each and every week through your generous support. God bless you all, and thank you. I just want to very briefly say... Um, if you feel the Lord moving you at all to support this ministry, there's tons of ministries out there. This is just the one that one of them, the Salem, loves. First and foremost, pray for those babies. Pray for the staff who are emotionally drained by pouring out to them. Uh, of course, there's always the ability to financially give. If you do, mark your um, Mark your uh, offering plate as Children's Home or fill it out to the Florida United Methodist Children's Home, your checks. Uh, but also something I just want to toss out there for you to consider is if somebody just feels a lead on their heart and you want to know more about what it means to foster some kids, have them come in your home, 
There's a difference between fostering and adopting. Fostering is saying, I'm going to give you a steady place to live so you don't just have to live into the system. Come speak with me. Speak with Elizabeth after service. Thank you. Please stand and join us. to a young boy named Harrison. Um, Harrison is in a very similar ministry up north as this, and he's been getting packs of your cards over the span of a month. He's got two more packs we're going to send him. You are impacting lives. And, and I don't know what God is or isn't calling us to inside of this specific space with this ministry, but here's what I do know. All right? That, that when somebody is stripped away completely of these things, faith, hope, and love is the greatest, they often need it in reverse to get back to where they're at. They need love. It's only through love that they can believe hope exists. And it's through love and hope that faith can be sustained. So for yourself or so, for somebody you love, perhaps today they need one of those three things. So go out. Don't just be speakers of the word and make noise. But be lovers of the people. Receive that as your mission and your blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.